Tastemakers was funded in part by... It all comes down to creating something unique. It's important to take pride in one's work and share expertise. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement. Salt is something that is very easy to take for granted, but there is more to this essential mineral than you may imagine. Come along with me to Oregon in this episode of Tastemakers and get a taste of sea salt that has been hand harvested from the pristine waters of Neatarts Bay. I'm Kat Neville, and for the past two decades, I've been telling the story of local food. In that time, American food culture has exploded in tiny towns and big cities from coast to coast. In Tastemakers, I explore the maker movement and take you along for the journey to meet the makers who define the flavor of American cuisine. Filling a need is the key to successful entrepreneurship, and when Ben Jacobson moved home from Scandinavia, he couldn't find the finishing salt that he fell in love with over there, so he decided to make it himself. Prior to starting Jacobson Salt, I was living in Scandinavia, and I lived in Denmark and then in Norway for five years, and really kind of found out about great salt there. When I moved back here to Oregon, at that point I was clearly fascinated by it, but the only salt that I could find was from the UK, France, and then a couple of other um, very small producers. And I started to scratch my head. We're a nation that's nearly surrounded by seawater and just wondered if it was possible to make salt here. And spent the next two and a half years trying to figure that out. And of course, anybody can make salt, but it's very, very difficult to make salt that's delicious every single batch. We grade our salt by taste, texture, and color. Our salt is super, super clean and briny with no bitter aftertaste, and that's a very deliberate taste that we strive for in each and every batch. Texture, our salt is super light and flaky, and then color, our salt is brilliant white. And so it's really kind of a culmination of all those three factors that I became fascinated with. And just the fact that like great salt can influence anything from like super easy and chill to you know, all the way up to Michelin star restaurants. So you might be wondering what the difference is between table salt and sea salt. Well, generally speaking, table salt is mined from ancient deposits of salt on land, while sea salt is simply harvested from water in the ocean or the sea, and that's why the source of the water is incredibly important. All salt originates from the sea. Even the salt mines that are underneath Detroit was once a, you know, a sea that has, has dried up and is now mined and then made into table salt. That being said, table salt is made in a highly industrialized manner. And what happens there is you get this granulated table salt that's very, very uniform. And while it is uniform, it, it tastes like a chemical. And when you taste a granulated salt next to a pure sea salt, you will taste the difference immediately. A table salt generally tastes bitter and there's an astringency to it um, that tastes like a chemical. And then you taste a sea salt next to it and you get that like beautiful briny like burst of salinity and then it dissipates and it tastes natural because it is natural. You'd never guess it, but right behind me, Sarah Marshall is cooking up some of her nationally distributed hot sauce, and it includes just a sprinkling of Jacobson sea salt. Let's go in and take a look. We're here in our basement. It's where I run my business, and we live upstairs, which is really cool. And so we have a totally, completely separate commercial kitchen down here. 
Our sauces, I always say, are based on local produce. They're not just vinegar-based sauces, so it's very important that our sauce has a lot of flavor. It's not just about heat, it's not just about vinegar. We're really representing the farmer's market, and Jacobson Salt helps us to do that. Not only because we're side by side with each other, we're representing Oregon, we're using Oregon salt, we're using Oregon produce, but it also helps with the flavor, so it just enhances all of the produce that we're using. So salt plays into each one of your sauces. I mean, it's one of the main ingredients. Where salt is really important in what I do, not just in my sauce making, but in canning, is that if you use salt that has preservatives in it, it doesn't dissolve in the, in the jar of pickles or the jar oh. of salt. So a lot of times it'll leave these little composites over the side and it'll look like mold. It's not mold and it's not unsafe, but you are adding preservatives to your food, which usually people are canning and cooking because they don't want to do that. So it, it became very important for us to pick a salt and then use only that. So once I met Ben, that that was it. We just used his salt. <laughs> and it also follows the philosophy of what you're doing where everything is local. Yeah. You just happen to have local sea salt Which is, here in gorgeous Oregon. It was just meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> My very first recipe was for our habanero carrot curry sauce. It's still my favorite one. And I started out with just four sauces, and now we have a line of 20 that come in and out of season. Dirk and I are sitting in the dining room, yeah. and you host a lot of tastings up here. I do, yeah, two a week is basically what we aim for. So I set the sauces up for every guest to be mildest at that end, and each one gets progressively spicier as you head this way. The smoked habanero barbecue is our mildest, sort of sweet and smoky. You can taste that brown sugar yeah. in there. It really is prominent. But it, and it, like I said, it's very mild. Yeah. Serrano ginger lemongrass is our most popular sauce. It's one of the four that we offer year round. It's very fun because you'll get a pronounced sweetness up front, mm -hmm. three seconds of aromatics, and then the serrano comes in. Three seconds, exactly. Ooh, it's hot too. Yeah, there it is. I'm really excited to try the habanero carrot curry. This is the sauce that started it all. It is, uh, it's very near and dear to both our hearts. The flavor is outstanding, like that roasted carrot. It's not just basic raw right. carrot flavor. No. You get like a really deep, almost caramely sweetness from it. Yeah, the roasted carrot sweetness is tempering the habanero, mm -hmm. and then the bridge between the two is the spice curry blend that we've done. So it's like everything's working in unison. This is where things are gonna change. Okay, <laughs> thank you for the warning. Yeah, so this is the hot heirloom <laughs> habanero. Don't go full scoop, I would say, <laughs> but uh, just go a little bit on the spoon. What's interesting about this is that it'll open on your palate for about a minute, and then it just hangs out for a little bit. So it's not gonna melt your face off by any means. My face is not melting. Yeah. And it actually has real flavor to it. Yeah, That's yeah. good. Thank you. Okay, there's one more. And yeah. this is a salt. So it was inevitable that eventually my wife would make something there where there's just no moisture involved. It's just <laughs> chilies and spice. And so this is the Volcano Sparkle. So she dehydrated all of her favorite chilies and a touch of Jacobson salt and citric acid uh, just to kind of wake up the palate. Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Dirk is like, you're gonna hurt yourself. That is very hot. Yep, there you go. <laughs> but it's balanced, again, I think that Sarah is a magician you can actually get the flavor of all of those farmer's market ingredients yeah. that she's really trying to put on a platform through these hot sauces. I'm, my, my mouth is on fire. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to talk and I'm having a tough time. Well, you ate the spiciest things that we make all in succession, so yeah. very impressive. Yeah, well, that's and, good stuff. And just straight. There's no chip, there's no water, There's you just went right in there. Well. You gotta go all in. Yeah, I like that. I admire it. <laughs> Sweet needs salt. The two flavors enhance each other. Just think about salt and caramel. And so that's why today we're gonna to meet up with Tyler over at Salt and Straw. He uses Jacobson salt in a number of his handmade ice creams. 
Salt and ice cream is actually a really, really magical combination. Cream and sugar in and of itself have such complex flavors. And so a little bit of salt goes a long way in just amplifying all those flavors. But the cool thing with working with Ben is that we get to actually focus on what types of flavors the salt's also adding on top of that. And the simplicity of cream and sugar actually allow for those flavors to really showcase themselves. Salt and Straw was the first customer to actually have our salt for sale on the shelf. And I'll remember that forever. They just were incredibly supportive from day one. And now they use our salt in their ice creams and the ice creams that they make are incomparable. So the ice cream that you're gonna make for us today is one of your first flavors. Yeah, one of the very first we ever invented. It uses two really special ingredients from here in Portland and the flavor is so intense, it's beautiful. I have chocolate here. It's a Madagascar bean that is roasted here in Portland. So we're gonna use this in two different ways because I want the flavor and texture of that chocolate to come through in really unique ways. The first is we're gonna make almost like a chocolate syrup. We're adding this hefty amount of Jacobs and salt. It's gonna kind of wrap all of those flavors together. It's gonna to amplify the chocolate flavor, but it's also gonna add a little bit of pleasant salinity to the back notes of the flavor. And we're gonna whisk that into just a really simple, clean ice cream base. So that's gonna be the base of our ice cream. Okay. And then the second is, as that's spinning, we're gonna melt this chocolate. We're gonna drizzle it into the top of the machine. And this is an old school ice cream making technique called freckling. It's not used very often because you can't do it in large exactly. manufacturing mm -hmm. facilities. You can only do it in small machines that we just so happen to make. As we pour it into the ice cream, it hits that ice cream and freezes immediately. And it's getting shredded up, freckled into the ice cream by the blades of the machine. Look at the texture, it's totally Isn't that freezing. so cool? This is super cool. I'm gonna do this at home. Now we need to try it. Yes, that's the best part. Tyler, yeah. that's yummy. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, I always gravitate toward chocolate ice cream. It's always mm -hmm. my top pick, but I'm always a little bit disappointed because I don't mm -hmm. get that super intense, mm -hmm. rich, complex chocolate flavor, but that's what you totally get here. And with the freckling, the way that the chocolate is just like mm -hmm. in teeny tiny shards, like totally interspersed it throughout. It melts immediately. Yeah. Yeah, and the cool thing is between the salt and the chocolate, this is a flavor of chocolate that you've never tasted before in your life. I think most people are shocked. You know, it's, it's like the first time you had wine other than Carlo Rossi. <laughs> you know, you're like, what happened? <laughs> that is delicious. Thank you. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Oh my goodness. As I had figured out a process for making salt consistently, with taste, texture, and color being the, the three primary characteristics of great salt, I then went and tested 27 different spots of water from southern Oregon coast all the way up to Nia Bay in Washington state. I wanted to find the best seawater for the salt that I was making. We are on the very south end of Neatarts Bay. Neatarts Bay is a seven mile long bay that is right on the edge of the Oregon coast, and it's arguably the cleanest bay on the west coast of America. Tens of millions of oysters are farmed here annually, and each of those little oysters filters seawater. And so by the time the seawater reaches us, we've got this like ultra high salinity, pre-filtered by oysters seawater, and it's the perfect storm of, of really perfect salt making conditions. That whole process from seawater right here to dry flake of salt right up there takes about two and a half weeks. And Paul's kind of our last line of defense to make sure everything's the way it should be. So the water comes in clean. We pump into two 10,000 gallon bay water tanks. We hold it there, put it through a high pressure filtration system, which takes it down to one micron, which is very small. We hold that water in our, in our pre-brine tanks. When we pump it from the pre-brine tank to the boils, it goes through another one micron filter. So we filter all the way down to one micron, which prevents microplastics from getting into our salt because I want to be sure that we're obviously producing the best product possible and, and with that, that's free of microplastics. And we've had our product tested and that's confirmed and so that feels really good. We have four large boil pots in here. It's so nice and warm in here. It is. It feels good. <laughs> What we do is we fill this up, we'll put 300 gallons of the filtered brine in here, and we boil it and we boil it, 
we have valves on these lines and we adjust them slightly till we get it till it's going into the boil pot as fast as the water is boiling away. We boil seawater, of course, to remove the volume of the seawater, but most importantly, to remove the calcium and magnesium. We extract that from the seawater to give our salt a super, super clean, briny taste. So after it's boiled, where does it go? When the salinity reaches a certain point, we shut it off, we let it cool off a little, okay. and then we pump it into our holding tanks, and from there to our evaporators. These are our evaporators, they're 150 gallons. We fill them up with the brine that we pump from the boils, and then we put fire underneath them. What you can see happening is the flake will form on the surface of the brine. Oh yeah, look at that. And they're that beautiful kind of pyramid shape already. Right, yes. It forms that way naturally. Nothing we can do can make it happen or stop it from happening. And you can see on the bottom right. of this yes. piles of this soft white right. salt that is just kind of sunk to the bottom and it builds up and when it gets to a certain depth we scoop it up, we put it in the barrels. The barrel sits here till it's full, it's moved back there. That's where I rinse it. It looks like I'm washing away a lot of the salt. What is happening is it's compacting. Okay. And the stuff that is getting washed away is the calcium and magnesium compounds. After we rinse it, we let it drain for three or four days and then we put it in the dehydrator. The dehydrator just kind of gets the rest of all of the small bits of moisture out? No matter how long we let it drain in the barrels, it's never going to be dry. Okay. A lot of the sea salt you buy, you, you pick up the bag, you see there's a little bit of moisture in it. Yeah, absolutely. It's not been dried. It's just been drained. And there's nothing wrong with wet salt. We just want to give people a pound of salt, not three quarters of a pound of salt and a quarter pound of water. Makes sense. And also the texture, when you pick it up, it doesn't cling to anything. Right, right. And it's, it's, it's beautiful stuff. This is our post-production area. This is where all of the magic happens. Would you like to assist me in this? I would love to. The salt has been drying for four days. It's beautiful. I love that sound. It means the salt is perfect. When we get it sifted, we have stuff that looks like this. It's gorgeous. It is beautiful. It is light. It is delicious. May I taste it? Yes, you may. And what we're looking for is, first of all, it should taste all across your tongue, not just on the salt receptors. That's what we call sweet. It should be bright. In other words, very clean flavor. It should be brief, there and then gone. Absolutely. And brainy rather than salty. No scratchiness at the back of the throat. And not super intense. It's really kind no, of light. It's very subtle. Yeah. And the texture of it is lovely. It's, it's so crisp. Mm -hmm. We're going to wrap the episode at a collaboration dinner at The Schooner, which is a restaurant near Jacobson's production facility in Neat Tarts Bay. But first, we're checking in with the folks here at Patricia Green Cellars. This industry is all about collaboration, and they provided the wines for the dinner. How did you get connected with the folks at the schooner? Well, the general manager, Lexi Fields, is actually my cousin. Oh, nice. So she has been part of the Patricia Green Cellars wine scene since I've been here, which was since 2003. So when she was going into this collaboration with Jacobson Salt Company, she needed wine to go with the dinner, because why wouldn't you, right? And she thought of us. So the first one is a dry muscat. So what is this going to be paired with? Uh, this is the welcoming wine. It goes fantastic with oysters on the half shell, which Needs Hearts is very famous for. This is almost lemony. Isn't it nice? Yeah, it's really nice. It is not sweet, and it's very light. Yes. I'm excited to try these pinots, because obviously that's what you're known for. It's kind of the heart of what this winery is about. So what we chose to do for the dinner is two cuvées that we do based on soil and not vineyard specific especially since we're talking about Oregon and what the agriculture brings to the salt, to the grapes. So what we chose to do is a volcanic cuvee and a marine sedimentary cuvee. So these are really to show you expressions of what happens when you choose a vineyard that's grown in volcanic soil. 
It has like a really nice tannic character, but it still has a fruity kind of berry hint to mm -hmm. it as well. Like it's not a dusty wine. Not at all. And really good acidity. Mm -hmm. So it can pair really well with a lot of different foods. Yeah, that was lovely. Okay, so now we're moving on to the marine sedimentary. So this is the counterbalance. These wines, they're both Pinot Noir, but they are completely different in terms of their character. This is much more like bright fruit, very forward on the palate. This is much, um, much more gentle in a yes. way. So this is gonna be with the main course. So this is gonna get your meats and also go with some scallops that are gonna be seared too. It's wonderful. All right, well, I think we're just gonna have to head over to dinner <laughs> and see what Cora pairs with all these. Yes, that'll be fun. Cheers. Cheers. We've been using Jacobson Salt for a long time, like since the beginning of Jacobson Salt. And so we're constantly thinking about it and they're constantly coming up with different flavors. And we were just kind of throwing ideas around one day and a couple of us started talking about doing a choose your own adventure dinner. And we all thought that that would be a really fun idea to create a menu where we can have different salts available from Jacobson and the guests can come and kind of have you know, the experience that you laid out for them, but also they get to play around with the salt and how it works with the dish that they're eating at the time. And then we knew we wanted to do a wine pairing also with Patricia Green Cellars. For me, the collaboration is all about food. It just really comes from a love of food, I suppose. I get excited about food. I get excited about serving food and collaboration is important to me. And I'm lucky enough to work with a really great team. Jacobson salt is superior. It has a completely clean flavor to it. You can put a piece of salt in your mouth and once it's gone, it's gone. There's no aftertaste. So it's remarkable in that way. And maybe that's why they're able to create such delicious flavored salts as well because they're not combating that aftertaste or bitter flavor that you would get with a different salt. We have chosen the white truffle salt the black garlic salt, the rosemary, the dried worm salt, the Pinot Noir, and the black lime salt. So we just started playing around with smoking oysters ourselves, and it worked out really well. They're delicious. And eggs, to me, are the perfect vehicle for different types of salt. And so I thought a smoked oyster deviled egg would be a beautiful thing on a Choose Your Own Adventure salt dinner. Then we're going to the smoked squash soup. Squash is something that you can flavor in a savory way or you can flavor it very sweetly. So again, it's the perfect vehicle for different flavors of salt. You definitely have to try the Pinot Noir salt with the beef, but honestly, any of the salts would probably be delicious on that. The peach pastry. You have sweetness on the end with the ginger custard and then the savoriness of the caramel corn. And that combined with the peach, which also has spices inside of it, is uh, again, a perfect vehicle for that salt. Ever is everything not a perfect vehicle for that salt? <laughs> I think the answer is yes. Put the salt on everything. So we've taken a break from the dinner and Ben and I, we've snuck over to the bar side of the restaurant yes. and we're gonna chat a little bit about this experience. Chef Cora was really thoughtful, I think, in taking inspiration of your salt. She really made it so that people are interacting with the salt directly and yeah. making choices about how much they want to put on, what flavors they want to add. Yeah. And like to you, what do you kind of hope that people are gonna walk away from this dinner with? I hope people walk away from the dinner with an appreciation of good salt, but also just a curiosity, um, not only about salt, but just how much better food can be. I think it's important. I think it's very easy to kind of get set in your ways, and um, life's too short for that. A lot of people get obsessed with things, but very few people turn that into their profession, especially when they're aren't very many examples of people who have gone before them. I mean, yeah. when you launched this company, the idea of making artisan salt in America was probably pretty weird to most people who you talked to. Probably very strange. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. I was just determined that it could be done here. 
it's a challenge for sure, but it's, it's, it's also fun. I mean, making something from nothing and creating an industry in America that didn't exist before, I'm proud of, and I'm proud of our entire team that makes it possible. I truly believe that we're making people's lives better and bringing people together through just better food. In this episode, we've seen how sea salt enhances flavors, both sweet and savory. For recipes and more information on Jacobson Sea Salt, just head to wearetastemakers.com. Thank you for joining me here in Oregon, and I will see you next time. Connect with us online at wearetastemakers.com or through social media on these handles. Tastemakers was funded in part by It all comes down to creating something unique. It's important to take pride in one's work and share expertise. Edward Jones is proud to support the craftspeople who define the maker movement.